Hello, um, welcome everybody to um, this afternoon's webinar. Uh, my name is Peter Giuliano. I'm the uh, uh, the chief research officer for the Specialty Coffee Association and the executive director of the Coffee Science Foundation. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce this web webinar. So, um, but first I want to make a special uh, expression of gratitude to Pacific Barista Series for um, supporting these Expo Weekend lectures. Um, we couldn't do it without the support of, of, uh, of, of Pacific. So thank you very much to them. Um, so we're gonna have a, a short lecture here um, and I'll introduce the speaker in a minute, but um, during the lecture, if you have any questions, we're going to answer questions at the end. So you can hold the, your questions at the end or you can type them into the, um, the questions uh, tab on the Q&A tab on your screen and they'll accumulate there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the lecture. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the speaker. Um, this is Andrew R. Cotter who's a master's student in food science at the UC Davis Coffee Center um, in Davis, California. And he's going to be reporting on some research that he did that is under um, our collaborative research project between the SCA, the Coffee Science Foundation, and, and, uh, and UC Davis on understanding um, all of the details of uh, brewed coffee from um, the chemistry to the extraction to what Andrew's gonna be talking about, which is consumer preferences. So um, please help me welcome Andrew Cotter. Andrew? All right, Peter, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm here today to talk about a project that I conducted mostly throughout last spring, which was looking at how um, consumer preferences for drip brew coffee vary as a function of different brewing variables. Um, we're all in the business of selling coffee here. So whether you're a um, barista looking to um, revamp your your brewing profiles or if you're just looking to um, brew better coffee for yourself at home, I think you'll find this information very valuable. Um, if you saw Dr. Rist or Professor Riston Parts talk yesterday, um, looking at how the flavor of coffee changes as a function of different brewing variables, um, in addition to roast level, you saw a setup for a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today. But just in case you haven't seen that, I will be giving quite a bit of the background information that he went over as well yesterday. So here's an overview of my talk. Um, I'm first gonna be talking about a review of what's known as the coffee brewing control chart. This is a major focal point of my study and is what we based our experimental design off of um, before going into exactly how we conducted the study, what was the coffee that we used, um, who, who participated in the study, how was the, the questionnaire set up and things of that nature. I'll talk a little bit about brewing and how we achieved these different, um, these different extraction profiles before jumping right into the results. Um, I have a few different sort of categories of results that I'm gonna be talking about. I have um, CATA, overall liking, and JAR. I will explain what all of those mean in a little bit here. And then I'll finally jump into the conclusion. What is the main takeaway from my research um, and what are the sort of the action items that we can extract from this. Okay, so a little bit of history. Um, this is um, the person that I have pictured over on the left here is a guy named Ernest Earl Lockhart. He is a MIT biochemist turned Antarctic explorer turned coffee researcher. Um, in the mid 20th century, he founded this organization known as the Coffee Brewing Institute, which was a trade organization based out of New York City that really looked to um, do scientific research on coffee and coffee quality in order to um, in order to develop some standard practices to help the coffee industry brew and serve better quality coffee. One of the most impactful projects that he over that he um, oversaw was published in 1957 under the title "The Soluble Solids in Beverage Coffee as an Index to Cup Quality." Um, this project led to the development of what's known as the Coffee Brewing Control Chart, which I have here in the middle which is um, still a very popular chart used today throughout the coffee industry in order to in order to evaluate the quality of different brews. And it is still officially endorsed by the Specialty Coffee Association. It's used to train baristas. It's used to evaluate how well home brewers um, are able to achieve different extraction profiles through their home brewer certification program. So a little bit about how this chart works. Um, we have two variables on this chart that are used to predict the flavor and the quality of the resulting coffee. 
we have the strength or the solute concentration of the brew on the y-axis of this chart. And then we have the extraction or the soluble yield um, on the x-axis of the chart. And to illustrate what these two variables mean, exactly what, they, what they're measuring, I'm going to virtually brew you all a cup of coffee. So I have a little basket over here with some dry coffee grounds in it. And then I have a cup down at the bottom. So we're gonna make a little bit of a pour over. So we're going to go ahead and pass our hot water through this cup of coffee and that was that was quick we now have we now have ourselves a virtual cup of coffee so how does this relate back to the coffee brewing control chart well first of all i'm sure many of you know that coffee a, cu a cup of coffee is not actually doesn't actually contain a whole lot of coffee it's actually mostly water so we can split this cup into two separate parts we have our water and we have what i'm just going to call coffee stuff for now this is going to be all of the dry solids that were extracted out of the beds and are now down in our cup of brewed, brewed coffee. The total amount of coffee stuff or the percentage of coffee stuff in this cup of brewed coffee is going to be the strength or the solute concentration as a percentage of the total mass of the cup of coffee. So for a typical cup of drip brewed coffee, this is going to be anywhere from one to 2% coffee stuff and the rest of the 98 to 99% of the cup is going to be water. Now, in addition to this, we have this percent extraction um, term on the x-axis of the chart. And this doesn't refer so much to what is in the cup as, as it does to what is no longer in the um, bed of dry coffee. So when we passed our water through our bed of dry coffee, we, we made our cup of coffee and we took some certain percentage of what was originally up here and it is now down here. So if we know the total mass of coffee stuff, in our cup of coffee, and we divide that by the total mass of what was originally up in our bed of dry grounds, we get our extraction yield or our, sol our sol solute yield. So this is a great chart. It's been a really great tool and it's really helped push the coffee industry forward. Um, but we, as a research group, have three main, or two main areas of um, interest when it comes to the way that the chart is currently constructed, specifically, um, when it comes to consumer preferences. The first, first area of interest we have with this chart is the decision to separate this chart into nine very distinct regions. You see this like strong, underdeveloped, strong, strong, bitter, um, separated by these boxes. Um, we feel that this sort of sends a signal that the changes in flavor and um, ultimately quality um, is not very large in between or within these boxes. So as long as you are in this ideal zone right here, no matter where you are in it, um, there's not gonna be much of an impact on, on consumer acceptability or quality. Um, we feel that that's not really, that doesn't really account for the, account for the gradient nature of the flavor changes and resulting impact on coffee quality um, that's going to exist with these changes in extraction profile. So we want to we want to investigate whether or not these boxes really truly apply. Second is the use of the term ideal to describe this um, this area in the center right here. When this chart was made, this chart was made quite a long time ago using um, panels of um, this, this chart was made back in the 1950s using panels of middle-aged housewives. Um, and it's not to say that the opinions of middle-aged housewives doesn't matter. It's just that we think that that is a very homogenous sample of a very heterogeneous population of coffee consumers. So there's a lot more people that drink coffee um, out there than just middle-aged housewives in the 1950s. And this chart was optimized based off of data coming from those people. In addition to that, um, it's been quite a long time since the 1950s, quite a, quite a bit of time has passed and the coffee industry has um, shifted quite a bit. And we, we, we think that along with that um, shift in the coffee industry comes a shift in consumer preferences. So we wanted to update this chart to more accurately reflect the, um, the opinions of today's coffee consumer. So those are our two main motivations for undertaking this project when it comes to consumer acceptability. There's a few other areas of interest that we have with this chart when it comes to these um, flavor descriptors um, on the edges of the map. If you are interested in that, I invite you to watch um, the the talk given by Mackenzie Vitali tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific time, where she's going to investigate these um, these various regions when it comes to um, flavor. I'm focusing specifically on consumer acceptability.
Okay, so we've done our review of the coffee brewing control chart. So I will go ahead and jump right into the experimental setup, talk about how we did our tastings, the survey design and things of that nature. So the specific experiment that we ran, like I said, it was run um, last spring, spring 2019. Um, it was a three weekend consumer study done in the what's known as a sensory theater here at UC Davis. This is a um, auditorium that can be converted into a consumer testing facility by placing these dividers up in between um, the consumers. We place these dividers up between the consumers in order to ensure that their evaluations of the copy are independent and not influenced by maybe the reactions of the person next to them. Maybe if the person next to them tastes a coffee that they really don't like, they might grimace and that's going to affect the evaluation of the person sitting next to them. So we put these dividers up in order to ensure um, in order to ensure independence of evaluations. We serve, we had 27, 27 total samples that we investigated. I will um, illustrate that for you in a little bit. Um, and 27, 27 coffees is a lot of coffees to taste in one sitting. So we split it up into three separate tastings. So we served nine coffees per, per week or per tasting session. Um, we had a total of 118 consumers of black coffee come and taste all 27 of these coffees. And if you do some quick math, um, 27 times 118, uh, that's over 3,100 individual tastings of coffee, over 3,100 individual data points when it comes to consumer liking and things of that nature. So it was quite a, quite a large study. Um, it, was a, it was a feat of logistics in order to, um, in order to conduct the study. And in addition to all these considerations, um, we needed to randomize and counterbalance the serving order of the coffee. So that means that every consumer that was in the study had their own sort of order in which they tasted all these coffees. This helps to reduce what's known as a carryover effect where the order of the coffees, the, the order in which you taste these coffees might influence, um, might influence how you perceive these coffees due to comparisons from the coffee that you just tasted before or expectations set by the first coffee and things of that nature. So what these consumers rated, um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but they rated their overall liking for the coffee on what's known as the nine point hedonic scale. Um, they rated temperature, flavor intensity, mouthfeel and acidity using what's known as a just about right scale. Um, they had a list of 17 descriptive attributes um, that were adapted from the coffee tasters flavor wheel that they could use to describe the flavor of the coffee in a sort of check all that apply list. So the Consumers could taste the coffee. They had this question, which of these terms do you think applies to the flavor of the coffee? And they could just select which terms they thought um, adequately described the um, what they were experiencing when they tasted that coffee. And then finally, they rated purchase intent at three dollars a cup. At the end of the survey, at the third or at the end of the study in the third week, they filled out an exit survey where they answered questions about their demographics, uh, their coffee consumption frequency, and their purchasing habits, preferences towards coffee shops, and things of that nature. So a little bit more about the specific questions that we asked during the um, during the experiment. First is the overall liking using the nine point hedonic scale. Um, this nine point hedonic scale was originally developed back in the mid 20th century by the US Army Quartermasters um, as a way to receive feedback from their soldiers regarding how much they liked the food that was being served in the cafeterias or the canteens. Um, it's since been adopted by the food industry and by sensory consumer research as the um, standard way to receive feedback regarding degree of liking um, from consumers of any food product. Now, the construction of the scale um, is the following. So we have this like extremely term up at the very top. We have a dislike extremely term down at the very bottom. And then we have a neither like nor dislike sort of neutral option in the middle. And then the separation between the top and the middle and the bottom of the middle is sort of filled by these intermediate terms like dislike slightly, dislike moderately, like slightly, and like moderately. Now, one of the big um, assumptions that we make about this scale is that the difference in liking between each of these individual points is the same. So say the difference in liking between like very much and like extremely is the same as the difference in liking between dislike slightly and neither like nor dislike. This might seem like a very small assumption, but it ends up actually being very consequential because it allows us to assign equally spaced numeric values, say one through nine, to each of these um, terms that describes their degree of overall liking. And this allows us to treat this data as what's known as interval data, which basically means that we can calculate things like mean and standard deviation and variance 
and do a bunch of really cool statistics on the, the output of these nine-point hedonic scales. So next we have our list of check all that apply terms. As I mentioned, um, the consumers tasted each of these coffees. Um, for each coffee, they were, they were asked what words would use to describe the taste or flavor of this coffee. Um, and they were allowed to select all the terms that applied to, the, to describe the flavor of the coffee. We have some flavor terms such as tea floral and green vegetative. We have some basic tastes such as, basic tastes such as sweet, sour, and bitter. And then we also have some mouthfeels like astringent and thick viscous. Now, finally, and then finally, we have the just about right scales. As I mentioned, there were four attributes in which they evaluated using just about right scales. That was serving temperature, flavor intensity, acidity, and mouthfeel. And the theory behind just about right scales is that when you're dealing with consumers that are very familiar with a given product category, they have very clearly defined expectations as to what the adequate intensity or amount of an attribute should be present in whatever food they're tasting. So you can use these just about right scales to gauge whether or not that whatever you can, you can use these just about right scales to gauge whether or not that attribute is um, perceived as being present in the just about right intensity or whether it is present in too little intensity or too much intensity. So the way that you word the answers to these just about right scales is dependent on the specific attribute that you're looking at. So I have two examples here. So. I have our jar scale for flavor intensity. We have just about right in the center. And then on the on one far end, we have much too strong. And then on the other far end, we have much too weak. For mouthfeel, it's worded a little bit differently. Um, we have just about right in the center again, but then we have much too thick and much too thin. In regards to our sample design, we ran what is known as a three by three full factorial design, which means we had three variables. We had percent total dissolved solids, percent extraction, those are our two um, coffee brewing control chart variables. And then we also investigated brewing temperature because we wanted to probe whether or not, um, whether or not these differences in consumer acceptability um, with regards to total dissolved solids and percent extraction were consistent among different brewing temperatures. So that, that covers one of the threes in the three by three factorial design. So we had three variables. In addition to the three variables, each variable had three levels, a low, a medium, and a high level. Um, and each coffee consisted of one level of each of these three variables. So we had every possible combination of each of these three variables in the study. So we could have had a low total dissolved solids, medium percent extraction, high brewing temperature sample, or we could have had a um, high TDS, high PE, high brewing temperature sample, and every other possible combination of these factors and factor levels that was possible. So now, now that I've talked about the experimental setup a little bit, I'll talk about some of the brewing considerations that we had to account for, um, especially since we were investigating brewing temperature. Um, there were some things that we had to take into consideration in order to achieve similar extractions at different brewing temperatures. So here's the results of all of our brews across these three different brewing temperatures, temperatures of interest. We had 87 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Celsius, and 93 degrees Celsius. And what I have plotted here is the um, the chemical measures of these coffees according to the coffee brewing control chart um, for all 162 coffee brews that were needed to um, serve all these panels across these three different temperatures. So you can see that um, we were able to we were able to achieve um, similar extraction profiles for all three of these different temperatures um, for all levels of TDS and percent extraction. Now, how do we do this? Obviously, if you're going to change the brewing temperature of the coffees, it's going to. Sorry about that. Um, if you change the brewing temperature of these coffees, that's obviously going to change the rate of extraction of the of um, the of the brew and the um, chemical profile of the resulting brew. So, um, since we're changing brewing temperature, we have to change some other variables in the um, brewing process in order to account for that change in brewing temperature and that change in extraction rate that results from that change in brewing temperature. So in order to highlight this, I have an example right here where we achieved similar extraction profiles or the same extraction profile at, at different temperatures. So we have our target um, level of TDS, which is going to be 1.5%, our target percent extraction, which is 20%. We have our two water temperatures, 87 and 93 degrees Celsius. Um, we use the same brew ratio. So we used a 14 to one brew ratio to achieve um, each of these profiles. But 
when we increased the temperature, we actually had to also increase the, um, we also had to increase the grind size and decrease the brew time a little bit in order to achieve this similar extraction um, at, this, at this higher temperature. So now I'll get into the, the meat of this, uh, this presentation, which is the results. I'm sure you're all very excited to see how the consumers responded to these um, various brewing profiles. So first I'll go over the results, results of the check all that apply. Again, just to rehash, we had these consumers um, use this list of check all that apply terms to describe the flavors of the coffees as they were tasting them. And what we can do with this type of data is that we can simply take um, a sum of how many times each of these terms was used to describe each of the coffees. And then what we can do with this is we can create sort of a sensory map using multivariate visualization um, in order to see in order to see the general trends and um, how much each of these terms is used to describe these copies. So in order to interpret the next set of results, I need to take you through a little tutorial about how to read a what's known as a correspondence, ana correspondence analysis, which is a form of multivariate data visualization. Um, what you're going to see next is going to be this map that has these um, black points on it and these blue points on it. The blue points are going to be um, these uh, terms that were from the check all that apply list and the black points are going to represent the different copies. Now, what, how you read this map is it's a two-dimensional map with a Y and an X axis, but these, the, these two axes don't really mean anything inherently on their own. Um, this map is more about the relative positions of these, um, different sam these different coffee samples and the relative positions of these different um, attributes from the catalyst. So for example, um, we have copy B way over on the left-hand side of our map here. And when we also have these two attributes right here, sour and citrus positioned very closely to coffee B. What we would conclude from that is that um, coffee B was more often, most often described as being sour and citrus compared to all the other coffees that are on this map right here. The same thing for sweet over here, like coffee A and coffee C. Um, since sweet is located very close to these two coffees, um, we could say that Coffees A and C were described more often as sweet and also less often as being sour and citrus um, when compared to coffee B. And then finally, we have coffee D down here. Um, we have another axis of separation right here. We have bitter up on the far end of this y-axis and then we have coffee D down here at the low end of this y-axis. And this positioning of coffee D we can interpret as it was pretty balanced in terms of its sour, citrus, and sweet. Um, profile, but it's located on the opposite end of the map from bitter, meaning that coffee D was very low in bitterness. And then additionally, one final point is that we have this attribute right here, berry, which is sort of located near the center of this map. This means that that attribute didn't um, was pretty much used at similar rates across all of the um, across all the coffees, meaning that it didn't discriminate between the coffees very well. Okay. So I'm going to show you the actual result of our correspondence analysis now. Oh, one, one more quick point. Um, we have our samples coded on this map according to their different levels of these different factors. So again, we had three factors or three variables. We had brewing temperature, total dissolved solids, and percent extraction. And each of these um, three variables has a number. Um, so for brewing temperature, we're either going to have 87, 90, or 93. For total dissolved solids, we're either going to have 1%, 1.25%, or 1.5%. And then for, for percent extraction, we're either going to have 16, 20, or 24%. Okay, so here's the results of our correspondence analysis, or our sensory map created based off of the selection rates for these different CATA attributes. Um, general trends you can see here is that there's this group of attributes over here. We have cereal, sweet, and tea floral being used to describe these coffees that are sort of clustered over here on the right-hand side of the map. Opposite these attributes, we have attributes such as burnt, thick, viscous, and sour being used to describe um, these coffees over here on the left-hand side of the map. We have terms such as citrus and rubber being used to describe the samples that are um, located on the top half of the map. And then we have attributes such as dark chocolate, roasted, and nutty being used more often to describe these samples on the bottom half of the map. Now, what we're really interested in here is seeing whether or not there is any separation of the samples based off of our variables of interest. Are these samples grouped together based off of TDS? Are they grouped together based off percent extraction? Are they grouped together based off of brewing temperature? 
So one feature of correspondence analysis is that the first axis, this horizontal axis right here, is going to describe the, the biggest trend or the most variation in the, um, in the data set that it's looking at. So when we look at the way that the samples group together um, on the, across the, um, the first dimension or this x-axis right here, I'll highlight this um, to show the trend here, we see a very clear separation of these samples based off of the total dissolved solid content of these different coffees. So we have the low, low TDS samples over here on the right being more often described as tea floral sweet and cereal. We have the high TDS samples on the left-hand side being more often des described as being burnt, citrus, and sour. And then we have the medium TDS samples sort of scattered across the center. Now, the next question we have is whether or not there is a separation um, of these samples according to another variable. We have um, percent extraction and brewing temperature left along the second axis or the y-axis of, um, of this chart. And when I color the samples according to TDS, you can see a weaker trend, but still a trend that's definitely still there of separation of these samples based off of percent extraction um, along this y-axis here. So we have the high percent extraction samples trending towards the bottom of the map being described more often as nutty, roasted, dark chocolate, and burnt. And then we have the low percent extra extraction samples up on the top half of the map being more often described as citrus, rubber, and sour. And then finally, um, we want to see, we've, we've already covered two of our variables. We want to see if there's a, there is any way that the samples separate according to brewing temperature. So if we highlight the samples according to brewing temperature, um, I personally don't really see a trend here. Um, if anyone does see some sort of trend, maybe there's a, there's a constellation in here of these um, samples according to brewing temperature, let me know. Um, but personally, I don't see a clear trend of separation of these samples based off of brewing temperature in this uh, in the sensory map. So we can say, um, based off of these results, that the consumers perceived qualitative changes in these copies based off of first, TDS. TDS was the most important since it was separating along the x-axis. Second, we had a separation of the samples um, according to percent extraction along the second axis or the y-axis. And then we, we see no separation of these samples according to brewing temperature. So that's sort of the order of importance of these um, variables when it comes to the way that the consumers describe the flavor of these coffees using the CATA attributes. So the next thing I'm going to show you, or the next series of results I'm going to show you is going to be looking at the results from the nine point hedonic scale. So the consumers rated their um, overall liking for each of these 27 coffees using this nine point hedonic scale. And again, I'm going to be, show, be showing you another kind of map known as a preference map, where with the sensory map, you saw that we were separating copies based off of the number of times that a attribute in the catalyst was used to describe the flavor of the coffee. Here, I'm going to be showing you how these coffees separate based off of consumer liking scores as opposed to these cata terms. So instead of points this time, you're going to see arrows. And what each of these arrows is trying to do, each of these arrows is going to represent one consumer in the study. And what it is trying to do is position itself pointing towards the coffees that that consumer liked and away from the coffees that that consumer disliked. So if we were to try to interpret this map right here, you see that we have two consumers that really liked coffee B and disliked coffees A and C. We had one consumer really liked coffees A and C and disliked coffee B. We have a consumer up at the top of the map who was pretty even in regards to their preferences regarding coffees A, B, and C, but they really dislike coffee D because their, um, their arrow is pointing away from coffee D. And then finally, we have a consumer placed towards the center of the map that really gave just that equal liking scores to all of the coffees in the study. Okay. So this is how you interpret what's known as an internal preference map showing how the um, consumer liking scores shook out across all 27 of these samples. As I said, we had 27 samples and 118 consumers. So the map that I'm about to show you is going to be quite busy. So here's the result of our internal preference mapping study um, or our internal preference mapping analysis. Um, we see all 27 of our coffee samples um, distributed along this map and we see the consumer preferences or the, each of the arrows representing consumer preferences sort of scattered in all the directions. What does this mean? This means that consumer preferences for these different coffees were all over the place. There wasn't one coffee that was really dominating the overall liking scores of these coffees. 
if all the consumers liked a, a singular coffee um, in the study, you would see all the arrows pointing towards one single coffee and away from all the other coffees. That wasn't the case. So we can conclude based off of this that there is a lot of sort of divergent opinions um, in which of these coffees was liked the most. But what we really want to see is whether or not the samples separated, sim similar to how we wanted to see if these samples separated in the correspondence analysis map according to our different variables. Again, we want to see in the internal preference map if these, um, if our different coffee samples are clustered together according to some sort of one, one of the three variables that we looked at, either TDS, percent extraction, or brewing temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and take the, um, just for clarity, I took the, the consumer scores off of the map. So now we just have our coffee samples. And when we look at the trend along the first dimension again, again, the first dimension is going to show, or the first, the x-axis is going to show the um, trend that explains the most variation in the data set. And when we color the samples according to TDS, we see a very clear separation of these coffees um, based off of total dissolved solids along this x-axis. So what this means is that while consumer preferences were scattered in a bunch of different directions, since we see this clear separation of these coffees along the x-axis of this chart um, based off of TDS, we could say that TDS is a very important um, consideration when it comes to determining an individual's preference for a single for it, for the coffees. Okay, so this leaves us with a pretty interesting question: um, How do we define the ideal coffee? Um, I just demonstrated to you that consumer preferences for these coffees based off of brewing temperature, TDS, and percent extraction were scattered all over the place. So how do we, how do we optimize our brewing profile? Well, there's a couple of ways that this could be addressed. Um, the first thing we could do is take the, take the route that Lockhart took and just simply take the averages of these likely scores across all the consumers in order to define the um, optimum extraction profile for our coffees. And this might be, this might be worth considering, but um, the problem with this is that while this might um, be the most like extraction profile for some of the consumers, um, it's simply trying to, it's simply trying to account for too many, too many divergent opinions. It's trying to please too many people at once, and in, uh, in in that, it's not really pleasing anyone to the maximum maximum extent that it could be pleased. And it might, it might even be really a really off putting brewing profile to a minority of the consumers in the study. So we could take the other extreme and define optimum extraction profiles for every single consumer. Um, but this is really, really granular and not very actionable. I think if you tried to incorporate this policy of brewing custom extraction profiles for every single consumer that walked into your coffee shop, you'd have some really stressed out baristas behind the counter trying to teach all the consumers that walked in about TDS and percent extraction and then figure out how to brew a coffee that suits their liking. So what the, the common approach that we take in consumer sensory science in order to address this issue of um, pleasing, pleasing a population that has very divergent opinions is what's known as consumer preference clustering, where we can group these consumers according to similar patterns of liking and disliking for these different coffees, and then we can um, to find the optimum, optimum extraction profile for the averages within each of these um, groups of consumers. So what we do to do that is we run all our um, consumer liking scores through what's known as a hierarchical, cluster, hierarchical clustering analysis um, algorithm, which, like I said, groups these consumers according to similar patterns of liking and disliking. So a quick way to interpret this, what's known as a dendrogram right here, is that um, with, it, with this algorithm, each consumer starts out like as some point in a space. And then all this algorithm does is it groups together people that are very close, close together in this um, multidimensional space. So if you start at the very bottom of this chart, um, two people that are going to be clustered together are going to be very similar in terms of their, their liking for these coffees. And then we can go up the chart and then we go up the chart and we group we, at first, first we group individuals and then we group groups and then we just keep on grouping groups until we have a reasonable number of groups to consider for our um, consumer preference clustering. 
when we when we looked at this dendrogram, we decided to investigate two different um, consumer preference clusters. So we have one cluster with an N of 50, 51 and a second cluster with an N of 67. And again, these clusters represent groups of people that are relatively similar in terms of their liking and disliking for these different copies in the study. Now, when we look at the way that the average overall liking scores shake out as a response to these different variables and these different levels of these variables in our study within these two clusters, um, we can see where their sort of divergence in opinions really stems from. So if we look at the average overall liking scores, that's the y-axis of this um, chart right here, for these different copies split based off of these different variables. So we have TDS, percent extraction, and brewing temperature as our three variables. And then each of them, again, has a low, medium, and a high, what's known as a factor level, or just a value given to that variable. So when we first look at TDS, we see some um, very clear trends. Um, you can see cluster one tended to give higher average overall liking scores to the high and medium total dissolved solid samples and lower liking scores to the low total dissolved solid samples. And what these um, what these different letters right here represent is statistical significance um, when we do what's known as analysis of variance on these um, analysis of variance on these on these different um, liking scores. So we can say that cluster one has a statistically significant preference for medium and high TDS copies over low. And with cluster two, we see the opposite trend. Their most like coffee signif statist with statistical significance was the low TDS samples followed by the medium TDS samples followed by the high. So we see this very clear divergence in opinions between these two clusters um, based off of TDS. One, one likes um, high and medium and the other likes low. When we look at percent extraction, um, we, when we look at percent extraction or PE for cluster one, we see no statistically significant um, differences in the average overall liking scores um, based off of percent extraction. So we can say that percent extraction doesn't really seem to matter for cluster one. Whereas with cluster two, we do see significant preferences. So we see that they tended to give the highest average overall liking scores to the medium percent extraction samples, especially when you consider that over the low percent extraction samples. And then finally, when we look at brewing temperature, we see some very slight variation um, in these average overall liking scores based off of brewing temperature, but there is no statistical significance in um, any of these um, any of these differences, at least when you look at brewing temperature by itself. So this was an idea that um, that Bill introduced, or Dr. Um, Professor Ristenpart introduced yesterday, and this was this idea of response surface methodology. Um, in case you missed his talk yesterday, I'll go over again what it is. So we have we have two variables that we saw in the last slide have that significantly impacted consumer consumer liking within each of these clusters. We had TDS and percent extraction. So we have two variables. We have two experimental variables and a response variable, which is going to be the average overall liking score. And what we want to know is if there is a way to relate these average overall liking scores back to the coffee brewery control chart. And indeed, there is a way. Um, it's, what's, it's what's known in sensory science as response surface methodology. And the, the example I like to use to sort of introduce this is what's or top topography maps. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen these before. These are a way to represent the elevation of um, the these are a way to represent the elevation of places um, using colors. So if you can imagine a, a city like um, a very hilly city like Pittsburgh or San Francisco, um, we can use these different, different colors on this map to represent different elevations within these cities. So what our variables would be here, we, we have north and south being our y variable, we have east and west being our x variable, and then we have our response variable, which is going to be the elevation, which we can represent using these different colors. So we have, um, we have a picture of San Francisco and we have a picture of Pittsburgh right here, both very beautiful and very hilly cities um, to help represent this idea. Now, what we can do with the coffee brewing control chart is use a similar, a similar idea where we have our two, um, our two experimental variables, which are total dissolved solids and percent extraction. And then we have our response variable, which is overall liking. So similar to how elevation is used to or similar to how color is used to represent elevation in these topography maps, we can use color to represent average overall liking score in these um, on the on on top of the coffee brewing control chart. So when we do this for each of the clusters, here's what we get. This is quite a bit to look at, so I'll walk you through it. 
Um, don't worry. So when we look at cluster one, we get to what, what is known as a saddle shaped curve. And so we have our percent extraction on the X axis of these charts and we have our total dissolved solids on the Y axis of this chart and the different colors represent different average overall liking scores. The orange represents the higher overall average liking scores and the white represents the lowest average liking scores. So you can see that cluster one has their highest average overall liking scores in the areas of high percent extraction, pretty much regardless of total dissolved solids, they liked, they liked high percent extraction coffees. But then in addition to that, they have high average overall liking scores for the low percent extraction, high TDS coffees. And you can see that in between these two in between these two values of percent extraction, there's actually a little bit of a valley in their peaks. Um, we like to refer to these um, this group of people right here as extremophiles. Um, they don't really seem to like coffees that are described by the center of the chart. They tend to like um, either what you could what you could imagine would be a sort of under extracted or an over extracted coffee. Um, and their differences in or their preferences based off of TDS depend on the um, specific um, specific percent extraction value that you're looking at. Cluster two is a little bit easier to explain. Um, you can see that their highest average overall liking score was given in the very low TDS range and sort of low to moderate percent extraction range. And then when you look at this a little bit more, you can see that when you're considering low percent extraction, um, their their average liking for these coffees based off of TDS drops off very quickly. So when you when you start with the low percent extract, when you start in the bottom left hand corner of this um, map for cluster two right here, and then move up the up the y axis to the top left hand corner, you can see that their their um, liking drops off very quickly, which is a little bit different than what happens in the high percent extraction range, where you see that their preferences based off of total dissolved solids actually remain relatively flat at these higher percent extraction values. Now, this is, very, this is a very different result than what we would get if we were to simply consider the average across all of these consumers, which is what Lockhart did when he originally made the coffee brewery control chart. Indeed, when we consider the average across all of our consumers right here, um, we don't draw these boxes around our clusters and simply feed all of the consumer liking scores into the equation that um, produces produces this chart right here, we actually get an ideal that is very close to what Lockhart had originally identified as the um, ideal zone for total dissolved solids and percent extraction, or maybe a little bit higher on the percent extraction or a little bit lower on the total dissolved solids. But overall, I would say we're pretty well in agreement um, with Lockhart's original study. Um, but if you refer back to the last slide, you can see that this area identified as the peak highest liking score for the total consumer sample was actually not the peak for either of these two clusters. So you can see this is a very real life example of how these divergent opinions in, in the, in the uh, average liking scores of these coffees can really affect your conclusions as to what the best coffee is. We would argue that the coffee identified or the extraction profile identified by this chart right here isn't actually optimized for anyone. It's simply trying to not displease anyone. So it is the least disliked coffee, not the most liked coffee, if that makes any sense. So the final final result I will leave with leave with you is the results of the just about right responses based off of these brewing variables. Um, we did this on a cluster by cluster basis in order to investigate the way that the different clusters responded to these changes in um, brewing variables. Um, and the overall trends in the way that the results shook out are pretty well preserved in between the clusters. So I'm just, for, for now, I'm just going to show you the results of cluster one in order to show you how the consumers were perceiving some of these, some of these flavor changes as a result of these different brewing variables. So let's start up in the top left-hand corner um, of this. We can see the, re we can see the distribution of resonces, responses to the just about right scales according to our different levels of TDS. And we can look at um, the serving temperature jar question. So we have, the, we have this jar question, how do you feel about the serving temperature of this coffee? Is it too hot? Is it, ju is it just about right or is it too cold? And then we have orange, orange would represent too hot in this case. We have yellow representing just about right and we have green representing too cold. So you can see that as a function of TDS, we see that 
as TDS increases, we have less people describing the coffees as being served too hot um, and more people describing the coffees as being served at just about right. Um, I have a theory behind why this was the case. Um, in order to, to brew coffees with a higher TDS, you need to use more, more, more um, dry coffee grounds. And with that more dry coffee grounds, with the same amount of water, those dry coffee grounds are going to cool the water as it is flowing through the beans and into the, into the carafe. So that might reduce the temperature, that might reduce the actual temperature of the coffee a little bit by the time it gets served to the consumers. Um, and we can, we can see similar trends for percent extraction. And then finally with brewing temperature, this is a good quality check on our experiment. We can see that as we increase the brewing temperature from low to medium to high, we see that the responses from the just about right question for brewing temperature, we see more and more people describing the coffees as being too hot as we increase our brewing temperature. Now, what's a really interesting result right here is the results um, based off of um, based off of TDS for flavor intensity. So at least in cluster one, we see that at low values of TDS, I'm looking at the second, the second row of the first column here, at the low values of TDS, we see 57% of people in cluster one describing the low, TD, the low TDS copies as being too weak. And then as we increase our TDS values, we see less and less of the people in that cluster describing the copies as being too weak. In regards to the effect of percent extraction and brewing temperature on flavor intensity, we, we don't really see much of an effect at all. When we look at acidity, now I'm looking at the third row and the effect of TDS on acidity, we again see a similar trend of what we saw with TDS, where um, the consumers were, described, were more often describing the coffees as being too acidic as the level of TDS went up. So we could, we could conclude based off of that, that um, the increasing TDS was increasing the amount of acidity that was present in the coffee, or at least the way that the consumers felt about the acidity. We see opposite trend for percent extraction, where we start off with 32% of the consumers in, in this cluster describing the um, low percent extraction samples as being too acidic. And then that value decreases as we increase our, our value of percent extraction. So you, you could say that as our coffee went from under extracted to over extracted, we had less and less people um, describing the coffee as being too acidic. And then finally, for mouthfeel, we also see an effect of TDS on mouthfeel where um, we start off with 46% of the consumers describing the low TDS samples as having too thin of a mouthfeel. And then that value decreases as we increase our value of TDS. So as I said, we did this on a cluster by cluster basis, and we have all 12 of these plots laid out for all the clusters, but I'm going to own and for the sake of comparing the two clusters, I'm only going to show you the most interesting result, which is the way that these two clusters responded to these jar scales based off of TDS. So let's look at TDS versus flavor intensity for these two clusters. So I'm looking at the second row right here. Um, in, cluster, in cluster one, as I mentioned before, we start off at low TDS with 57% of the consumers in this cluster describing the low TDS samples as being too weak in their flavor intensity. On the opposite side of that, in cluster two, we only have 44% of the um, consumers in cluster two describing these coffees as being too weak. So we can see where some of this um, divergence in opinions of the coffee based off of TDS stems from. We had 57% of people in cluster one um, say that the low TDS coffees are too weak compared to only 44% for cluster two. So cluster two was a little bit more apt to um, the low TDS coffees when compared to cluster one. We see a similar trend for acidity where 32% of the, um, we see the, we see the, actually the opposite trend for acidity where um, in cluster one, 38% of the high TDS samples were described as being too acidic. Whereas with cluster two, 43% of the um, high TDS samples were described as being too acidic. Okay, so that's the bulk of my results. So I will jump into the conclusions and what the main um, take home points are from my study. So first we have consumers perceive qualitative changes in coffee flavor as a result of TDS and percent extraction. This is hearkening back to the results of the um, CATA and the, the responses to the just about right scales. We saw very clear separation of these coffees on our CATA um, on our check call that apply flavor map based off of TDS and percent extraction, but not based off of brewing temperature. 
Um, so, so we could we could very easily say that these consumers were were perceiving qualitative changes in the flavor of these coffees based off of these two um, variables that are laid out on the coffee brewery control chart. We saw lots of inter individual variation in preferences for these different extraction profiles. Um, this is hearkening back to the um, the internal preference map where I showed you the arrows of the consumers sort of scattered all over the place across all of these samples. Um, there was not one sample that was sort of dominating the overall liking of all these consumers. So we see lots of inter-individual, what we're going to call inter-individual variation. And piggybacking off of that point, we saw that total dissolved solids was a major driver of individual preferences. Um, we saw it impacted consumer attitudes towards flavor intensity, acidity, and mouthfeel. Um, in the responses to the jar attributes. And then finally, the biggest takeaway point from all of this is that there is no one size fits all solution to the ideal extraction profile. We saw consumer segmentation in this relatively small consumer, or I'm, I don't wanna say relatively small, it was a large consumer study, but it, it, is, it was in no way representative of all of the coffee consumers that are out there. Um, this was done on a very, this the study was done on a single coffee um, for a sample of consumers that were mostly college age in a Northern California college town. Um, we, saw, we saw segmentation in just this very small, um, we, saw, we saw segmentation in just this very small sample of consumers when it comes to the overall population of, um, of black coffee drinkers out there. So with that, we could say, we could say that um, we, we would expect to see variation in preferences for these different extraction profiles, no matter where you go, no matter who you test. In addition to that, it's going to change um, based off of what specific coffee you're looking at, what roast level you're looking at. So our takeaway point from this is that maybe our paradigm regarding um, extraction profile shouldn't be that we there's this one extraction profile that we need to hit in order to um, maximize liking for all people for all coffees. Maybe it's something we should tinker with a little bit more and tailor to suit the specific um, situation that we're in, whether it's a whether it's a new coffee or a new roast level or a different set of consumers, you should really play around with these extraction profiles to highlight these specific flavors and maximize the liking for the um, consumers that you are looking to serve. So that is the end of my study. Um, I just wanted to give a, quick, a few quick shout outs to all the people that helped to um, conduct this study. It, this, was a, this was a very large undertaking. It was very lo um, logistically intensive. Um, I had a small army of people helping me, um, helping me prepare and serve all these coffees. So I have them all listed right here. Um, we had funding provided by the Coffee Science Foundation with underwriting by the Breville Corporation. Um, we had the coffee donated by Royal, Royal Coffee Importers in Oakland, California, and the coffee was roasted by Jen Apodaca. Thanks, uh, Andrew. That was, uh, that was a great uh, presentation. And um, uh, yeah, speaking um, for the Coffee Science Foundation and especially the Coffee Association, this is really, really, we're really pleased with this, um, with this output. And, uh, and I just, uh, and, this is exactly what the study was aimed to do. Um, so that's very gratifying. And I want to echo your uh, gratitude towards uh, Breville, who um, uh, three years ago now uh, provided a uh, generous contribution of both um, uh, resources and also equipment that helped us achieve um, a lot of this. So, um, so the first question, there's a few questions, Andrew, and, and uh, I'm hoping we can get to as many as possible. First of all, there was a lot of questions that are were coffee people, and of course, everybody's dying with curiosity about what specific coffee was used. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So this was a this was a medium roast wet uh, a washed Honduran coffee um, that was again um, donated by Royal. Um, I don't have the specific like lot or w what region of Honduras it came from, but I can tell you that it is a medium washed a medium roast washed Hondur coffee from Honduras. Um, we chose it because it, was re it wasn't too out there in terms of its flavor profile. It wasn't like a natural with these very strong um, fermented flavors or anything like that. Um, we wanted to choose one that was relatively neutral and wasn't too dominated by one specific attribute. Great. There were some other questions about, um, about when would this, uh, with this research become more widely available? Um, uh, Andrew, and maybe I'll take a swing at that, Andrew, and then maybe you can, um, you can, uh, uh, add on to that. Um, Andrew's been giving at Sensory Summit. He gave us a, a presentation on this. Um, we actually got to taste some of this stuff. 
um, uh, there's this presentation, which is part of him sharing outputs, but uh, Andrew is in the process of preparing an academic um, uh, paper. So all of this um, uh, research that, that we do collaboratively um, is published academically, which is really cool because it becomes part of the academic literature. Um, and then, and then after that, um, or once once that process has started, then we'll work on um, producing plain language um, reports. So papers that often we publish in Twenty Five Magazine that uh, go into some of the details of this. And then in the future, we're we're um, planning on using this information to revise um, our brewing handbook, um, which we which is part of SCA's um, uh, knowledge base and also our education. Um, anything to add there, Andrew? I think you pretty well covered that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, uh, let me get through to some of the other specific questions. And this one comes from Bailey. If the, if the goal is to make a cup of coffee that someone enjoys, would you say that the ultimate TDS and percentage extraction mat matter significantly and the water temperature get used to get there is insignificant? If yes, do you think this applies to most other variables as well? Um, I would say, in, re in response to the first question, um, I would say yes, as long as you are able to achieve the target TDS and percent extraction value um, that you're looking looking to achieve, um, at least within the range of, of brewing temperature values that we tested, um, our argument is that no, that, that does not matter. You will need to obviously adjust your brewing um, your specific brewing recipe to account for these different brewing temperatures. But as long as you're hitting that target TDS and percent extraction, we didn't see a whole lot of variation in the acceptability of these coffees based off of that. And then what was this? What was the second question again? Um, uh, it, if it, in that case, what about the other variables? Um, so after, besides uh, brewing temperature, we looked at brewing temperature, percentage extraction, um, uh, TDS, what about other variables such as grind coarseness, for example? Yeah, so grind coarseness is again one of those variables that's ultimately going to determine where you end up um, with with regards to that TDS and percent extraction um, value. So we are we're, we're what we're arguing is that that is the that is the final measure that needs to be considered. Um, how you how you get there, at least in terms of brewing temperature and grind size and brewing time, um, doesn't seem doesn't seem to matter as much. Another question about the consumers, how they were recruited. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so how, did you only recruit uh, black coffee drinkers or um, did you ask in them anything about their consumption habits? Um, yes. So we, we, sent out, we sent out the screener. I think, I believe we had about 2,000, 2, 2,500 or so responses to the screening survey. Um, the demographic that we were looking for, we specifically wanted to get people that indicated that they drank black coffee um, at least a few times a week. Um, in addition to that, there are some considerations such as um, dietary restrictions, caffeine sensitivities, um, and things of that nature. But mostly it was people that indicated that they drank black coffee with no, nothing added to it at least a few times a week. And they were available to, to participate in all three of the required tasting sessions. Uh, a couple more questions about the coffee. How was it brewed? And, and you mentioned it was a medium roast coffee? Yeah. Um, and it, go ahead. Continue. No, go ahead and continue. Well, I think it was brewed in in a in a Curtis machine, a large format um, drip brewer. Is that right? Yes, yes. So we did, we we have this um, in the lab. We have this whole set of these um, Curtis automatic drip brewers. I believe they brew three. They they brew about three liters of coffee at one time, um, and you can you can program them to um, use these different recipes using a different like duty cycle what's known as like the duty cycle or the water pulsing on off cycle. You can adjust the, the brewing time, the brewing temperature and things of that nature. So it was, it was, it was all brewed drip in batches, right. large batches. This is an interesting question from Rami and I'll, I'll read it. Um, given the saddle profile of cluster one, um, wouldn't, would we, wouldn't we be seeing an averaging effect in the just about right responses? And why wasn't cluster one broken into two sub -cl clusters? Oh, that requires a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, drink a coffee actually. Um, okay, so so sa saddle shaped response curves are actually pretty notorious for being hard to interpret um, when it comes to um, consumer preferences. Um, 
In response to why we don't see an averaging effect as a result of the just about right scaling, um, I'm not sure that I really have an adequate answer prepared for that, but I will, let's see, I'll try to, I'll try to do my best. Um, so in response to the just about right scales, we saw a pretty, pretty basic trends that we would expect to see based off of these brewing variables. Like with increasing TDS, we saw um, increasing number of people saying that the coffee was too strong or too acidic. And that was, that was true regardless of cluster. Um, I would think that as you, let, let's say as you're increasing percentage, let's say as you're increasing total dissolved solids, um, I don't think you're going to have people showing the opposite trend where they start by saying that the low TDS samples are too strong and the high TDS samples are too weak. So in that case, um, I don't think there would be an averaging effect on the jar scales. If anything, you might have more people just hang out in that just about right, um, that just about right area. And then what was the second part of that question? It was, it was wondering why, um, given the saddle um, response, and then also the fact that, that if you looked at the dendrogram, there was two clusters underneath the, the, the in cluster one. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why wouldn't you divide, um, try to divide that group a little bit further? Okay, um, so this is, this is getting into um, clustering analysis a little bit, but if you actually, if you go back and look at the dendrogram, um, I'll pull it up really quick. You actually see that cluster, cluster one is actually more homogenous than cluster two. Let me pull that up. Okay, so if you look at if you look at that slide again, you actually see that cluster one is more homogeneous than cluster two. How do we know that? Because the um, the point that links these two subclusters of cluster one is lower on this uh, height scale than it is in cluster two. So despite the fact that cluster one was um, displaying a saddle shaped curve, their opinions were actually more homogeneous than that of cluster two. Oh, very slightly, but if you were to if you were to split if you were to split cluster one into two subclusters, you would also have to split cluster two into two or maybe even three subclusters. Right, right, right. So is your feeling then about this cluster one, which you call the extremophiles, there's not you don't think that there's a, a, a subcluster within cluster one that it, it, it uh, that um, that was liking the very high percentage extraction coffees and another subcluster that was liking the low extraction coffees, you think that in general, these, these, this cluster homogeneously was attracted to those extremes? Yes. Yeah. Because if, if, if this was split into two subclusters where one cluster, where, where one cluster preferred the, the low TD, there were the low percent extraction and disliked the high percent extraction, another cluster liked the high percent extraction and disliked the low percent extraction, that would result in an evening out of or a flattening out of that um, that curve that goes along the percent extraction values, um, if that makes sense. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there was a question about um, acidity, which is um, it was from um, Ewan. In coffee, normally acidity is is thought of as a challenging descriptor in coffee consuming research, and indeed can be shown to be a divergent sensory construct even in cupping professionals. Was this an issue in your study? Um, no, it was actually one of the one of the big findings of our study. Um, I have I have some more data that I didn't show that suggests that the um, aversion to the high TDS coffees that was displayed by cluster one or no cluster two was actually more driven by acidity than it was by absolute flavor intensity. And if you go back to the response surface of cluster one or the response surface of cluster two, excuse me. Um, we see that their peak is at the low TDS, low percent extraction value. And then it quickly drops off um, as the TDS, TDS value increases, at least within the low percent extraction, which you can interpret that if, if you know a little bit more about coffee flavor and how it changes as a result of brewing. You can say that this top left corner of this chart right here um, usually indicates a, a very strongly sour coffee. Um, when you look at the other side of the map within the high percent extraction, you can see the TDS doesn't really impact their um, preferences all that much. So based off of that and a few other results that we have, we can, um, I'm confident in saying that the aversion to the high TDS coffee is displayed by cluster two was more driven by strong acidity than it was by strong flavor intensity. Great. Um, 
just a couple more. Um, there's a number of questions about that have to do with the demographics um, mm -hmm. and asking your opinion. Are, are, are you, do you have any intuitions about cultural differences? Did you see any gender differences um, or anything like that? Yeah, um, so, I, so the, the, the point of us doing the exit survey at the end of the survey was once we did the clustering analysis, we wanted to see whether or not any of these demographic or psychographic factors could predict um, which cluster um, these consumers ended up in. When I went and did the analyses of these um, demographic factors based off of these two clusters, I really didn't find anything that significantly predicted what, which of these two clusters these consumers fell into. There could be a few reasons for this. Um, we did have a, a just like the um, um, just like one of the arguments with Lock, with Lockhart study, we did have a pretty homogenous sample of consumers where um, our consumers were pretty heavily skewed towards the Gen Z um, mid twenties um, demographic, and they were all from the same town in Northern California. Um, so that that could just be that could just be a result of them all having similar exposures and similar. Um, or very sort of homogenous, homogenous demographic profile, or it could just be due to the fact that there are other bigger drivers. There could be other bigger drivers of liking um, out there in coffee that could be predicted by uh, demographic and psychographic factors. Things such as like roast level or coffee origin or wet versus um, wet versus natural processed coffee, we think would be bigger drivers of consumer segmentation than perhaps these um, differences due to TDS and percent extraction. Great. Um, so finally, uh, I'll, we only have time for one more question, but there was a, one uh, last question I thought was a good one. Was there anything that surprised you in this research um, uh, that you found especially, you know, surprising? Um, the saddle shape curve by cluster one is definitely a very surprising one. Um, like I said, those are notoriously hard to interpret when it comes to um, con consumer acceptability studies. Um, in addition to that, I was really shocked when we did the um, average, the average overall, and how close our average result was to Lockhart's original result, which I have on this slide um, right here. That was really quite shocking to see that, um, at least according to his philosophy that he used for analyzing the data, um, we were we were really we were really close. We just have a difference in philosophy as to how the how the data should be handled. Yeah, that was that was surprising to me too. Okay, well, Andrew, thanks again um, so much for your time. I know that there was a lot of questions that we didn't get to. Um, I'd like to invite people to, if, if you've got a burning question that uh, you'd like us to pass along to Andrew, we can do that. You can um, reach us at the Coffee Science Foundation, especially Coffee Association. I am at Peter Giuliano on Twitter, um, and I'd love to talk about uh, this stuff. But uh, for now, I'd like to stop by thanking Andrew, um, thanking once again, Paris, uh, uh, Pacific Barista Series um, for their support of this webinar. Um, and uh, thanks UC Davis, Breville, and everyone for all the support. So thanks again, Andrew. Thank you, appreciate it. Bye everyone. <laughs>